like to acknowledge the Arakwal people, the custodians of the land and the first storytellers in Byron Bay where we meet. I'd like to acknowledge any Arakwal people here today and also any other Indigenous people present. Melissa Lukashenko, of course, among those. Um, and then before we get on with the panel on fair use, you'll notice to my left uh, there is a picture on a chair of two young people. This is the Penn Empty Chair. Penn was founded in 1921 to act as a powerful voice on behalf of writers harassed, imprisoned and sometimes killed for their views. The empty chair on stage is a symbol adopted by Penn International to represent the writers who cannot be with us because they are imprisoned for their writing. These two are Thai student playwrights Patiwat and Portnip and they are in jail because of a play they wrote. They were found to have contravened Thailand's Les Majeste law. The charge of Les Majeste criminalises um, alleged insult of the monarchy under the Thai criminal code and is commonly used to silence peaceful dissent. To find out more, please go to pen.org.au. And today we have Tom on my left who is a uh, legend, writer, a living legend. A living legend, but in terms of Penn, uh, Tom has been very active and is on our writers panel of Penn Sydney. And it's something that's very close to me. I'm the president of Penn Sydney and I'm very pleased that Byron Bay has adopted the empty chair for this festival. Uh, so before we begin that, thank you. So I uh, look, you are a, a committed bunch. Thank you for coming to a session on copyright. As a lawyer working in this space, I think it is really important and I think some of the things that are being proposed at the moment have the potential to be very damaging to our publishing ecology in Australia. Um, today's session focuses very much on the legal doctrine of fair use uh, and we've been talking about that in Australia since before I walked in the door of the copyright agency 13 years ago. Um, to, to understand fair use and its implications for Australia, I need to set the scene in Australia a little bit with our copyright framework. And I'm going to try not to turn it into a lecture because it could go all day. Um, copyright has always been a matter of balancing the, the exclusive rights of our authors uh, with the need for um, people to have access to works. And Australian law has always acknowledged that there are some circumstances where it's in the public interest not to make users have to go and get individual permission from writers and their publishers to get access to works. And these in Australia are called our fair dealing exceptions. And they include private research and study, criticism in review so that we can read book criticisms in the paper and they can quote from books and they don't need to ask the authors. Reporting the news, uh, conducting legal cases, very handy for us lawyers. And more recently we added to the list of our exceptions in Australia parody and satire, time and format shifting and that meant that we could record programs on our video recorders to view at a more convenient time and that we could format shift works so that if we had photos, we could digitise them and have them on our computers and viewable digitally. And there was also an extended fair dealing exception that was put into the Act to let the print disabled, education and libraries do things that they couldn't do under other provisions. And then for copyright agency, um, probably the most important part of our copyright framework are the statutory licences that we run. And they were a response to what was then lightning speed technology and that was photocopying. <laughs> and it's funny to think that now, but uh, we came into existence in 1974 and our educators were finally, they had photocopiers to a stage where they were being used a lot and our educators were photocopying the very best bits of content to share with their classrooms. Our members, authors and publishers said well, that's a big problem for us because people aren't buying books. Their teachers might be buying one copy and they're just cherry picking the best content and our business model is totally undermined. There was a long series of negotiation, uh, litigation ended up in the High Court and our High Court affirmed the fact that our authors have rights in their works 
And none of those exceptions that I mentioned to you before were ones that covered this mass copying of copyright content. The University of New South Wales, there was a test case between them and, and the authors and publishers over Frank Morehouse's The American Babies. Um, and the UNSW had a cute argument. It said, all right, if it's not um, for mass use uh, and it's private research and study, we'll just get all of our students to queue up at the photocopier and they'll print, you know, push the print key and there we'll get around it. And our court said, no, actually, that's called authorisation. Um, so what do you do when you fail in the courts? You go down to Canberra and you agitate for legislative amendment to the Copyright Act, which is exactly what our education sector did. And publishers and authors very close after that. Our federal government, I think, showed a great deal of foresight when it said, both sides of this equation have completely valid arguments. Our teachers have to be able to use world-class technology, and if that's photocopying, they have to be able to use it uh, to teach our students from the very best works from around the world. At the same time, our authors and publishers must be remunerated for their works. They have to have a livelihood because they have to be able to go on telling Australian stories. So they said, OK, compromise. We will enable the use of these photocopying machines in the educational sector on the basis that no more than 10% can be copied, otherwise go and buy the book. And very important for our members, the education system must pay equitable remuneration through copyright agency back to Australia's authors and publishers. So that was the, the beginning of the idea of copyright agency um, and we extended into the government sector and in 2000 our licences were extended to cover digital copying and communication. Um, we started out, I think our first uh, cheque was $16.21 <laughs> and then in, by 1989 we were distributing $1.1 million. And we have now become an organisation, a not-for-profit, owned by our authors and publishers, that collects and distributes over $120 million a year. And that is sustaining for our publishers and our authors, and it helps them to invest in writing more Australian books. Mm. Um, so very basically, that's what we're about. Uh, fair use is a, an exception in the copyright land of America, a lot of people have argued for a long time that it doesn't comply with the Berne Treaty, which is the international legal document that all countries sign up to, um, because it's not a certain special case. It, it, it's not separate enough. We look at it and we say, we have an exceptions framework in Australia that provides a great deal of certainty for our authors, and for the education system, for government, and for people wanting to rely on those other exceptions. In the US, the fair use doctrine pretty much says, well, if you're going to have a transformative use, then you can rely on fair use. You can't know what that is unless you go to court. And so they have a lot of litigation in the US. That, that's never been a very big part of Australian copyright law. Uh, we also think that our local authors probably don't have the means to take on some of the companies that would willingly rely on an exception like fair use. Um, even US jurors who might have been supportive of fair use 20 years ago have said it's evolved to something so different and so much more far-reaching than what we understood in the US that they no longer support the US doctrine. Um, so this is a very brief introduction to what this is all about. Um, and I should say, the Productivity Commission, uh, which has made a number of recommendations and has been reviewing our publishing industry, in its draft report in April this year, said, along with the parallel imports issue, and that's a big issue for the publishing industry in Australia, but this fair use, they said we should adopt a fair use style exception in the, in the Australian Copyright Act. Um, copyright agency is viscerally opposed to it. We've seen what happened in Canada where they said we want to have a um, fair use exception for the education sector 
all the heads of the ed education sector said, this has nothing to do with not wanting to pay copyright fees. We're very happy to pay our authors and our publishers. It's nothing to do with that. The day that law came in, in Canada, a whole lot of the education system said, we are no longer paying our copyright licence to access copyright, which is our sister collecting society. They have lost $30 million a year. They're a smaller copyright society than us. Um, and what it has meant is Canadian, particularly in the education sector, they no longer have a major educational publisher that's Canadian. Oxford pulled out, various others have shut down. They just say, why would we bother um, publishing works when we get no protection for them? At Copyright Agency, we think that's very dangerous, uh, that we would be put in a position where we go back to the 50s and we start importing textbooks from places where copyright is properly upheld in the UK and in, in fact in the US the way it works there is a little better because they don't have all the other exceptions in the statutory licence. Anyway, we think it's very problematic and that's the background to today's discussion. Um, and I should say our licences for teachers to be able to use anything in the world with that 10% limitation, pay equitable remuneration, the education system for school students it's $17 a student per year. For tertiary students, it's $38. When you think of all the content that's shared with students, that seems extremely reasonable. Less than the cost of a book for schools, maybe the cost of two books or a book and a half for um, tertiary. So that's a bit of background. Now I'm going to bring in the people you're really here to see. Um, so Melissa Lukashenko, on my right, is an award-winning novelist and essayist of Indigenous and European descent. After working as a bar attendant, house painter and martial arts instructor, look out, she received an honours degree in public policy from Griffith University and has since lived in Canberra, Darwin, the Kingdom of Tonga and on the north coast of New South Wales. Her novels, including Steam Pigs, Killing Darcy and Hard Yards have won or been shortlisted for numerous awards, mm -hmm. including the Dobie Kibble Courier Mail Book of the Year and New South Wales Premiers and Commonwealth Writers Awards. And of course, there's Mullum Bimby um, that's come out since. Mm -hmm. Melissa works um, for the prisoner support organisation Sisters Inside, which she helped to found in the 1990s. Please welcome Melissa. <laughs> and Melissa, I ask you probably a leading question. How important is the idea of copyright to you? The idea is important, but the fact is even more important. Uh, I think uh, there's a, the idea of the author has a, a status in Australia and probably in Western culture generally, and lots of people still aspire to be authors today, although a lot of them uh, aspire to be filmmakers or you know, singers, people like that as well. But to be an author, it's, you know, it's still a big deal. It's still seen as this wonderful thing. And what goes along with that is this hilarious misconception that authors make a lot of money. And uh, it's very far from the truth. And if you know any of the statistics, I think the average income of an author in Australia is something like $11,000? Yes, that, that's correct. Yeah, so very, very few authors actually make a living off our writing. Uh, I guess some people start with the idea that they, they will uh, and are quickly disillusioned and then there's a small handful, maybe uh, a few dozen people that do make a living off it. But that doesn't mean that we should work for free. So the idea of copyright to me is uh, it's just common sense. You know, you don't go to the cafe over here and say, oh, coffee should be free use, where's my free coffee? And you don't go to the IGA and get your breakfast cereal so you don't have to buy it at Elements of Byron and pay whatever you pay here. You go and get a, a thing of muesli for three dollars fifty, and you, you know you don't walk into the shop and say, "Oh yeah, food should be free use." That free and fair or fair use, sorry, fair <laughs> use. That people would look at you like you had two heads, and yet. Uh, people who create ideas and people who create stories are, under this legislation, going to be expected essentially to work for free. Uh, publishing can't cope, writers can't cope. I've tried to write and not eat and not pay rent and it's proved <laughs> remarkably difficult. So copyright is pretty important and copyright agency is pretty important. Tom, I might ask you the same question. <laughs> yes. Um, 
the uh, Google crowd, I believe it was, spoke about, uh, declared that ideas yearn to be free, <laughs> creative <laughs> material yearn to be free. Well, uh, in industrial terms, as long as we're not, we could have a Stalinist set up or, or a socialist, uh, uh, Stalinist is a pejorative word, but a set up where the state employs us all, but that wouldn't work because we're always offending the state. <laughs> um, and it's always seemed to me, I was actually there um, when we launched uh, the copyright mm. agency and it was, uh, I was at the time president of the Society of Authors. So I've always seen writing as an industrial thing. My parents were workers and I look upon writing as my work and so inevitably I've been involved in copyright issues. And people say it's because I'm just looking after my own uh, nest. I don't receive, novelists don't receive a lot. Most novelists do they from copyright. It's poets and, and uh, the, in other words, the people who need it. Um, it takes so long to write a book mm -hmm. that the idea that we can have a literary culture without uh, paying a certain amount of copyright is grotesque. And be, but the uh, Australian Copyright Commission, uh, uh, the, not the Australian Productivity Copyright Commission, the Productivity Commission thinks it's all jake because if you, um, I if you can't afford to buy uh, a history of the Romanovs, which you actually want to read, you can get a perfectly good Dan Brown for about five cents cheaper than <laughs> it used to be. <laughs> and so this question that the copyright agency raises of the orthodox economics looking upon books as interchangeable widgets uh, is something that suits the extreme fundamentalist economics of our time, yeah. but yeah. which will devastate uh, Australian publishing and writing. Uh, when I, and I know this because I began writing in 64, before there was a copyright agency, before uh, there was a society of authors, uh, 62, 63 actually began writing, and very few writing writings by Australians. And it was great if you published a book, you were a big deal then. There were beautiful women who'd talk to you no matter how ugly you were. <laughs> <laughs> Which was one of the side effects of my first novel that I had not appreciated would be so welcome. Uh, and um, it was kind of, an Australian writing a book was considered here and overseas the equivalent of a Goanna riding a bicycle, a <laughs> phenomenon, a <laughs> miracle. And we will go back to that, the wealth of Australian commentary and publishing. Mm -hmm. We will go back to that without these uh, economic guarantees unless we bring in a system where they give us all professorial salary. That would be good, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> any salary would be good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm in it, but on behalf of other writers. My day is nearly done. My race is nearly run. Uh, Peter Carey and Richard Flanagan will survive no matter what happens here because they will get an increased British contract for their new books. Uh, but uh, b because they'll be able to sell the books here. But that's not the point. That's not why Flanagan and Carey and myself have written a joint letter on this and other issues. There is an ecology of Australian culture and Australian writing. That ecology did not exist when I was young. Mm. That ecology is richly displayed at an event like this. And the... the Frank economic conditions of its continuing is copyright protection. Uh, and on that basis, I would like to support this wonderful uh, flyer. 
uh, flyer that has been produced, uh, which makes a lot of the points that you've made already, mm. Melissa. Mm. And um, the uh, uh, in your ancestral culture, Melissa, the storyteller told the story and people liked it so much they didn't expect him to do any of the hunting. <laughs> he could stay behind and talk to women and they'd <laughs> feed him the best kangaroo loin. Well, I think and until we get the best kangaroo loin, we're going to fight. <laughs> we're sticking with the union. We're definitely <laughs> sticking with the union, Tom. And you're right, you know, for 50 or 60 or 70 or 80,000 years, stories have actually been the most highly valued commodity on the Australian continent valued more highly than protein-rich meat, you know, or water, obviously, is valued as highly. But the place of story, the place of identity, and uh, an Aboriginal woman said to me recently, we were talking about the narrative of failure and the narrative of dysfunction and, and how we counter that, uh, which is another issue, I guess. But she said to me, this is an old lady from up north, and she said, you know, bub, our stories are the strongest thing about us. Our stories are the strongest thing about us. And she meant that in contemporary society as well as in our tradition. And I think that's true for not just Aboriginal people, it's true for any society that works. Our stories are the strongest thing about us. Because any psychologist, any teacher, any academic, any parent or grandparent will tell you that until young people know who they are, until they have a narrative that tells them who they are and what they should be doing and what they can be doing, they'll flounder. So it goes to the heart of the society, the stories that we tell ourselves. And I just ripped up, um, whipped up a little list this morning and thought, if we don't continue to give um, something approaching justice to the creators of story. Um, you, you'll get an Australia that uh, more and more and more resembles a bland, internationalist, neoliberal society that doesn't speak to who we are or where we live. And you will have no follow the rabbit proof fence. You'll have no Gallipoli. You'll have no My Brilliant Career, no Red Dog, no Cloud Street, no Carpenteria, no Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith. No monkey grip, no Voss, no seven little Australians, no my brother Jack, no looking for Alabrandi, no a fortunate life, no picnic at Hanging Rock, no storm boy, no possum magic, no my place. Instead, you'll have certain American and British, maybe European writers, and the Enid Blightification of the Australian <laughs> literary landscape. Actually, I'm wrong. You might have Voss because there will be a small substratum of Australian writers who are middle or upper class who can afford to self-fund their work. And the great majority of writers, the people like Tom and myself and, you know, 95% of writers who come out of uh, ordinary families in the suburbs who have stories of meaning to tell each other, to tell the society and to reflect society back to itself we will be made mute. Uh -huh. We'll be made mute because there won't be any recompense. Apparently under this new um, framework uh, and Darius who's got the camera there will be interested in this. If you're transforming the use of a work, you can take it away and use it for free. And if I want to fight that, I have to go to court with all my massive millions that I've made from writing over the years. Not. So my book Mullumbimbi which talks to people in the Northern Rivers and beyond about what it's like to live here at this historical moment as an Aboriginal person or as a non-Aboriginal person, Darius or someone else can take that book, turn it into a film, oh, I've transformed the use of it, I have no say and I get no return. Why would I write another book? Why would I put my work out there? You know, I was already contemplating robbing banks. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a martial arts expert. I'd be worried. Um, Don't do it, Doris. I, I want to come back to a few things that Tom and Melissa have alluded to. And Google Books and the Google Books settlement is one that has caused our members a, a lot of concern. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard, most people have. 
Um, Google digitised the works of major libraries from around the world, 20 million works digitised, um, and they didn't seek permission from the authors of those works. And I can tell you, there are many, many, many Australian authors covered in that digitisation, no doubt both of the people sitting with me on stage and their works. Uh, it went through the courts many times. The US authors took a case against Google. Uh, Australia was involved in that too. And the it, it's illustrative of a number of issues. One, different courts held different things. So you had reversal of decisions. The law really doesn't seem very settled. Mm -hmm. You can only go to court to say, well, this is fair use or not, and it's subject to appeal till you've reached the highest court. One problem. Two, that the courts there finally held, actually, and copyright was always supposed to be about authors and the authorship of works. And the courts there have developed fair use with this Google's case to say, actually, it's about technological innovation. What does that have to do with copyright? Um, it might be to do with patents, but it's not about creative works as we know them in the form of books. Um, issues raised by the um, authors in those cases were, well, but you get a commercial return from that. You know, you're, you're selling a whole lot of advertising space. And Google said, oh, no, 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 we're not. This is all about the democratisation of ideas. Mm. Um, and we shouldn't have to pay for it uh, because we're not actually making money out of it and we're doing a public good anyway. Melissa, um, what do you think about that? What do you think about Google? I think we sort of heard what you think about Google um, and the without the economic reward to you. Well, I'm a bit agog to hear that my works might have already been stolen. They will have been. Yeah. Both my parents who are poets, all their works have been digitised under Google. Oh, I feel so democratised. <laughs> 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 there, there might be other words for it. Yeah. Um, there are no words really, you know. I, it's a long time since I went to Sunday school but I thought there was something in there about thou shalt not steal. <laughs> and Tom, your, your works of course will have been digitised. I, I'd love uh, the internet to be, uh, it yearns to be free too and not to be charged for. <laughs> um, uh, access to movies and so on, I believe we, we should... Uh, pay for that because again who is going to make a five million dollar ten million dollar australian uh feature film if their copyright isn't guaranteed mm -hmm. uh the um the reality of patronage and money will flee uh the absence of um of copyright and it's not that you won't, don't want to write another book mm. but the only way you can get the time to write a book is to rob the bank and mm. then write it while you're serving time. Yeah, I hope Google <laughs> opens a bank because if Google opened a bank, then I could rob that bank and it, and it would be nicely <laughs> circular, actually. And, uh, yeah, I was the, for trade union reasons, for professional reasons, mm. I was an amicus uh, friend of the court during the long Google trials. And um, the I was hoping the being an amicus curiae, a friend of the court, the curia, the court, would be more of an amicus, a friend mm. to us, mm. but it's left it wide open, hasn't it? And uh, uh, the writers' organisations don't have the means that corporations have. On, in the meantime, coming back from America recently, I was sitting next to an American lawyer who said, I'm going to... Um, uh, I'm going out on a trademarks case. Someone uses a bottle that resembles one of my clients. You can, in the business world, they want to keep, have the right even to the shape of a bottle, mm. to the tint of glass, and we are not to keep any right at all mm. over our uh, own work uh, because ideas... Uh, yearn to be free. Well, they do too, and but there is a balance between the yearning and the rea realities. Uh, the way there's a balance between the longing of petroleum to be free, 
<laughs> and, um, and that point is eloquently made in this. Um, there's another issue with um, fair use. There's a, a case that's very famous in the US and it was a case of a photographer and his name was Cariou and he had spent about a decade um, living with a Rastafarian community and he, he is a documentary photographer. He had built up relationships and trust with this community to the point where they said, yes, we will allow you to take photos of our community as we go about our lives um, and stuff that they considered quite private, but they thought, you'll be respectful, you've been here a long time with us, learning about us. He published a small book and um, if it had had some success, he said he'd made about $10,000 out of the book and that was after 10 years of work. Uh, an appropriation artist in the US called Prince uh, picked up a copy of this book and he is known for picking up other people's work and doing things with them that are transformative, like um, printing them at many times the size. So this little book with photos at size, he blew up to meter, sort of by meter um, visuals and he superimposed what, they, what the court called lozenges and they were sort of... Um, Oh, what do you call it, blue coloured lozenges and one of them was over a, a, a man who was naked with his hair down and he'd put an electric guitar over him and a gas mask um, in these blue lozenges mm -hmm. and they, there were numerous images like this and they were displayed in a large New York gallery where people like the um, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and whatever went and bought the works for a million dollars each. Um, no permission sought from Cariou and Cariou had been in negotiation with a gallery in New York about having an exhibition of these works and the gallery phoned him up and said, oh, we've just seen you've already done something so you obviously don't want an exhibition with us. And he said, what are you talking about? Then went and found this. That went through the US courts and again, one decision at one level, reversal at the next, reversal back the other way and in the end they said, oh, we think 20 of these are sort of transformative use. Five of them we don't know, we'll remit it to a lower court and there was a settlement. Um, I find that problematic on a copyright level to say that that's transformative use, but beyond that, there are serious moral rights issues. We have moral rights under the Australian Copyright Act. They're the rights to be attributed as the artist of a work and also the right not to have your work subject to derogatory treatment. Now, these rights don't exist in the US. Um, so anyway, I see that as a very, very big issue for us if we are thinking about this US fair use doctrine. Melissa, I turn to you and say, having heard that, what do you think? And uh, might there be special concerns about Indigenous story? Oh, absolutely. Aboriginal art and increasingly Aboriginal culture is being ripped off left, right and centre. Uh, in a way, this process of... Uh, taking away our copyright and undermining our copyright is a very colonial process in the sense that someone sees something, they like the look of it, uh, you know, as has happened over the last 200 years in Australia. I like the look of it. You either don't appear to be using it in the way I think is right or I'll just disregard the fact that you are the rightful owner, so I'll take it, I'll use it in the way I see fit. And if you don't like that, you can take me to court over many, many decades and prove me wrong in my legal system. So there's a, there's a beautiful parallel there, a beautifully horrific parallel, if you like. Uh, but yeah, I uh, think, uh, who was on your panel earlier? Geordie Williamson. Geordie Williamson was on a panel this morning and he was saying, uh, pointing to the fact that Australia has many, many, many millennia of uh, storytelling and literature behind us, that storytelling didn't start here when Captain Cook um, turned up and crashed his boat at what's now Cooktown and ran into the reef and had to stop for a month and get it patched up with the help of the local people. That there is actually a culture, an underlying culture here. And Geordie was saying it's, it's time that we started paying attention to that. It, these are the most exciting stories that we have yet to encounter from his perspective. And I thought, yeah, that's really good to hear. But the thing is encounter them and recognise them, but don't just sail in and start taking them as well. 
you know. Take, um, be aware that there's ownership of story and that there's ownership of history from our point of view. But when the Productivity Commission, it seems to be absolutely oblivious about the value of story and the value of narrative and what it actually is you know, to have a story about a place that attaches you to a place and attaches you to a people and a culture. Uh, I just, it's mind-boggling to think of what, what are these people thinking? You know, slavery was productive, not for the slaves, but slavery in the US was productive. Yeah. There was massive cotton profits, you know, generated yeah. in the American South. Slavery in Australia was productive. My great-grandmother was a slave in Queensland, as were many, many, many thousands of Aboriginal children and adults who worked unpaid for decades and sometimes for their whole lives. Th those activities were productive. Those activities generated profit for people, generated uh, cattle stations, generated sheep stations, generated ca cane farms, uh, cotton empires. But that doesn't mean it's right. You know, the Productivity Commission um, needs to pull its head in in a very big way. And I, I think it's what Tom said before, that the Productivity Commission is applying an extreme form of economic rationalism and just saying, well, Tom's book is just a widget. Mm. We can just replace it with anything, you know. 300 pages for 300 pages, doesn't matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a problem, I think. Mm. And it's Tom the, might It's the epitome of Philistinism. <laughs> Oh, not in, n not in. They might buy a better American book than my Australian <laughs> book is, but uh, it, it, it is. It is uh, the fact that we live now under the influence of deadly Friedmanite economics, mm. uh, which devalues everything that cannot be commodified. We have become uh, to hell with human dignity which can't be commodified economically, uh, you are a consumer of health products. You're not a poor, suffering human worthy of dignity. You are a consumer of education. You are merely a consumer. And these things, you know, can't come for free. Oh, you pay taxes on it, but they really can't come for free. <laughs> education, health, uh, uh, and communications in particular. And it is this inability to put a value on a, uh, to put a value on uh, our, our cultural treasures because they're imponderable. Mm. Uh, that I and also a value on the fact that we've got a real discourse of ideas running here. Mm. And uh, you, you want to, you have some magnificent fish in the lagoon, but it's going to be cheaper to drain the swamp. Mm. and bring in bottled water from California. <laughs> mm. um, <laughs> That's right. So That's I, right. I know our time is running short. These were put on your chairs before you arrived. It's a very simple explanation of fair use. I'd encourage you, if you're a writer, if you're a reader, please get involved in advocating for our writers and our local stories. And I'd like to think that after hearing from Melissa and Tom, you might oppose fair use. Mm -hmm. Um, if I, I know that many people say we want all the benefit of the internet and access to content. That's a terrific idea. Let's look at what the Scandinavians are doing. They have digitised the Nords, the collection in their national library, and they say anybody who's in copyright, we will pay you um, for the use of your works that's been digitised. It's something done under a government statute with the local writers and publishers organisation our equivalent there, Copy Nor, um, running it and paying back authors and publishers for their works. I think that's a fairer system. Um, and we've got a model, we can look at that sort of solution. I was going to ask, are there anybody with burning questions just before we finish up? Hands. <laughs> Do we have a mic? Hold on, we've got a mic coming. I'll, 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 repeat, the I'll repeat the question, Victor, if you say. Oh no, here we go. Is it why isn't there any protection under intellectual property rights in law? Well, we do currently have that, and copyright is one of the many types of intellectual property mm. that we have. And we do have rights at the moment, and we have a system in Australia 
that's working relatively well. And the statutory licences we run mean that the education system, government, corporations can have access to works, but that our creators are rewarded when their works are used. Mm. So um, that's currently recognised. But what would happen under this new system, if I'm understanding it right, is that the, your work would be stolen and you can seek redress through the courts, but you've got to have the money for lawyers. You've got to know that it's been stolen in the first place. And who's got money to go to court? You know, I struggle to pay the bloody power bill. I can't afford a lawyer. <laughs> Any other questions? First of all, Zoe, it's a shame that this is not better attended. It's the most important session in the whole festival. Thank you. In my view. Um, secondly, does Copyright Agency have any notion at this stage of how we're going in this battle with okay. uh, the government, if you like, or the Productivity Commission? Because a lot of us are Look, still I in the dark. One of the reasons we're filming this session is so that perhaps we can beam this out to our members and to readers. Um, how we're going... The Labor Party is now supporting us. They weren't always, and they've, they've said, OK, we get your point. Nick Xenophon is supportive of our cause. The Greens have recently come on board. We need more than that. The Coalition, we're working on it. We would like anybody um, who has a local member who's from the Coalition to go along and say, I value local stories, I value local creators, I don't want this set of changes, fair use, parallel importation. I mean, one of the more ridiculous suggestions of the Productivity Commission was to reduce the copyright term from the current life of the author plus 70 years to 15 years from publication. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that seemed incredibly unfair, and thank God the government just said, no, we won't be pursuing that, that's ridiculous. But that was because people just said, no way. Um, so we continue to agitate. One of the reasons this is kind of our kickoff for our formal program on fair use we want readers and writers to go to their local members and say, not on. Um, and we, we've got to a point where we need that. It's sad that um, Robert Hughes, the great Robert Hughes, is not still alive to lean on his nephew, Malcolm. Mm. We've got a question up no, the back. No, we've got one over here. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yep, sure. I wonder if you could comment on the implications of the TPP and the RCEP uh, proposal for copyright. Is the, is the Productivity Commission responding to anything in the TPP? I don't think so. Um, from what I know, the Trans-Pacific um, Partnership arrangement, and I don't think that is uh, looking at unsettling any of our copyright law, the TPP. And the Americans, in any case, uh, Jonathan Franzen said at the Sydney Literary Festival, uh, the great American novelist, that he said, God knows our people are in love with this radical economics theories, but they would not dare cancel any aspects of, particularly of, of parallel importation protections mm. for American publishing. Mm. And uh, that is the other thing. The Americans have a worse time with this sort of copyright, but with parallel importation. No one in America is going to cancel American territorial copyright. No one in the, the UK. UK would dare cancel um, English uh, territorial. territorial copyright, but they want to cancel Australian. And that will, the 17th biggest book industry in the world, employer of 11,000 people, mm. all, all this is in here. Uh, so... Um, you know, Alan Fells, that nice old chairman, he, <laughs> such a grandfatherly bloke. But some people are monsters not because they are Stalin, but because they were got at by doctrinaire people when they were young. Mm. I think we have another question. Sorry, uh, yeah, thanks for this session. It's been very illuminating for me and I hadn't heard of the, um, what is it, fair, whatever. <laughs> that doesn't sound very fair. Um, but I've still got a query around the internet and because um, I know a lot of younger people who think um, copyright's a bit out of date maybe because of all the mm. uh, access to blogging and yep. uh, all the things that authors also do uh, these days and... Facebook and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, you have spoke a little bit about the Nordic system, but uh, 
just whether, you know, how do you answer that criticism around uh, is uh, this copyright going to last forever in the, in the print form that we're aware of? Okay. Uh, as, as somebody who's worked in this area for quite a while now, um, I think th there's this attitude that somehow our writers should be giving away their work for free just because I want it. Um, I should be able to get access. And it's exactly what Melissa said. If I want muesli, I can't just walk into the IGA and say, well, I'd like that, thanks, I'm taking it. No, I don't feel like I should pay for it. Um, we, we would think that absolutely criminal. Um, with content, I know there's this attitude that somehow the regular laws don't apply, that this is a free environment. It's not true. The regular laws of copyright apply. They don't stop access. They just mean in some circumstances you pay. Um, and if you want to use things in particular ways, sometimes you need to get permission and sometimes you need to get permission and pay. Um, and I, I think it's bizarre that we say this content that people have spent so long creating, I, I just have a, a right to do whatever I want with it. Um, any other thing that we want, we, we understand that we, we respect people's property rights and we pay for it. Um, it, it's selective nationalisation to say, oh, well, the authors, they, they, their stuff will have that, but not the cars, not the shoes, not the... Um, so that would be my answer, and I think the onus is on organisations like Copyright Agency to educate people and say, this isn't just some terrible administrative burden and the money isn't just going into the ether or whatever, mm. it's actually going back to nourish our writers mm. and our storytellers. The and it's fair. There's a perverse kind of twisting of an argument in here somewhere that I haven't quite got to the heart of, but it's uh, ideas are very important and they must be disseminated uh, and they must be democratised and everyone must have access to these wonderful ideas and these wonderful works. But if they're so wonderful and so vital, why aren't people prepared to pay something for them? We're not asking to pay a lot, like $17 a year for a school student is not an enormous burden on the Australian state, I don't think. Not when you're talking about what makes us a culture, you know? The magpie, Kurumburun, came walking past. Kurumburun Yanbalela before. And I thought, hmm, when I was a kid, I remember reading Magpie Island by Colin Tearley and it was the most beautifully illustrated and beautifully written children's book. One of my favourites, still is today. And I thought probably that book of... Magpie Island would not be written if Colin Tearley didn't get some sort of a return as an author. He would have had to remain a school teacher and not an author. Okay, and I think we've got time for one last question. Thank you to the Copyright Agency and Tom and Melissa for your thoughts today and your eloquence in just distilling some pretty complex issues into really easy to understand terms. I just wanted to say if anyone else in the audience is passionate about these issues and wants to do something right now other than going to your local member of parliament. We have a, a website called bookscreateaustralia.com.au. Please do go and look that up. It has really handy information about all of these issues. And if you feel so inclined, there's a petition on there that you can join and sign that we're going to give back to the government at the end of this month. Um, so I do hope you'll, you'll visit that and um, consider signing. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. And can I get you all to thank Tom and Melissa for <laughs> being here today and speaking? And anybody, I have two free giveaways. You've been such a great audience. Um, Copy Fight, <laughs> a book uh, edited by the publisher, Pil <laughs> McGuinness from UNSW Press. One there, one there. There we go. <laughs>